So I want to thank everybody for joining us. Um, thanks for coming to the site, 2 to tie 3 to wincom I'm here with head coach Billy Mellis of Salesian High School, two-time state Division IV champion and also coach of the year. Been at Salesian for 20 years now. So we want to give Billy a round of applause. Everybody say hello to Billy. Billy Mellis. Hi. Thank also, you. my head coach, um, that I'm sure everybody knows this. So today we'll just talk about some of Billy's philosophies as far as the offensive side, defensive side, and kind of where he came from and kind of where he's trying to go. So first question, Coach, is uh, tell us a little bit about your background coming from Santa Cruz. Okay, so I, uh, I grew up in Santa Cruz. Um, I uh, always wanted to go to Cal. That was kind of my, my dream. Uh, I wasn't good enough player to play at Cal or anything like that. I was actually even a little bit maybe better baseball player, but um, but I uh, I, uh, I always wanted to go to Cal, and uh, that was kind of my goal was to just go there. Um, my dad uh, graduated from Cal. He was a student manager at Cal for Pete Newell, yeah. and uh, coincidentally, I played for Pete Newell's son at Santa Cruz High. And, um, so the, the Mellis family and the Newell family kind of goes way back on different generations. But uh, Coach Newell, uh, at, the, at my high school coach, Coach Newell Jr., uh, was very uh, influential in my life um, outside of my own family. I still look to him for advice and things of that nature. But um, So I, I, I was able to get into Cal. Um, and when I went there, I went and worked for the basketball team. I became a student manager as well at Cal under uh, Lou Campanelli, yeah. and uh, uh, that's another person that was very influential. I still stay in touch with him, and he comes to a few games of ours every year. Um, when I was at Cal, uh, there was an assistant coach named Bill Tressler. Yeah. You might know him. Familiar with Bill Tressler. Uh, Bill Tressler uh, uh, left Cal and jumped around the college ranks for a while. He was at UC Santa Cruz for a while. He went back east for a while. Um, he jumped around for a while and he ended up here at Salesian as the head coach uh, the same year that I was I finished at Cal. So he asked me to be his assistant. So he and I worked together for five years yeah. and got to coach you yeah. among uh, some other great players. And uh, when, when Bill moved on uh, to get back into the college ranks after about five years, that's when I became the head coach here. And this last year was my 14th year as head coach. So 19 years overall. Um, five with Tressler and 14 uh, beyond that. So that's kind of how I made it here. When I first took the job here uh, and became the teacher here, a PE teacher, uh, I, I kind of figured it was, you know, maybe a stepping stone for something other. I, I actually never really thought I'd get into coaching, but uh, it's been really, really enjoyable and really rewarding. And I never thought I'd be here for 14 years, but here we are. And, uh, and it's been really a joy. So, so as you can as you can see, Coach corrected me. I said twenty years. <laughs> He's been here nineteen years. So let's let's kind of step back a little bit, Coach. As far as um, when you were at Cal, talk about some of the people who who you were there with, some of the guys who were on the team. We know there's actually probably two famous guys that were on that team um, that some of the viewers might be familiar with. Yeah. So my my last year at Cal, uh, Jason Kidd was a freshman. Uh, Lamont Murray was, uh, I believe, a year ahead of him. Um, so we had those two guys. We had a bunch of other really good players um, leading up prior to that. Guys like Brian Hendrick, Al Grigsby, Keith Smith, um, some of those guys, um, Roy Fisher. You know, there, there were a bunch of guys that, that really came through at that time that were really fun to be around. As, as the program, as the Cal program got a little better, um, that, that last year uh, we went on to make it to the Sweet 16. That was kids freshman year. Yeah. Uh, Jared Haas uh, was on that team. Monty Buckley, um, some of those guys, and, and, and Lamont Murray, of course. So uh, it, was, it was a pretty talented team. And um, you know those were some really fun years. And, and like I said, Coach Campanelli was great to us and uh, as managers. And, and I still stay in touch with him all the time. And um, just really, between Campanelli and Tressler and Coach Newell Jr., um, those are kind of the three people yeah. in my life that I turn to for advice whenever I need to. And now Tressler 
uh, is back here at our school yeah. as a counselor. Yeah. Uh, he eventually got out of the college ranks uh, a couple years ago. He was most recently the head coach at San Francisco State, and now he's back here as a counselor. So to have him on campus, I probably go to him the most for advice yeah. just because it's so convenient, but uh, certainly those other two guys I talk to a lot too. It was very interesting to see him uh, when we played Albany High School, um, to see his son out there kind of playing and to see him hiding behind the, the door, uh, a little tense. Um, <laughs> was Randy Duck on that team also? Randy Duck was just after I was there. Okay. Um, when I was working for Tressler here as an assistant coach, I was an off-campus coach. So I was working at Cal um, just in their athletic department yeah. uh, for five years, and, and that's when Randy Duck came through. Okay. Yeah. So we'll, we'll transition a little bit to how coach, when he first got here, um, Salesian High School was – uh, all boys school for a while. My, I think my first year was the first co-ed class, or the year before my freshman year, which was '94. They went back to co-ed, um, so they went to co-ed. So they had been kind of down. So if you could just kind of talk about those early years from Tressler mm -hmm. and also kind of Ricardo Cole and Kurt sure. Chem. Uh, so so Salesian. Uh, had some really, really good teams like in the 70s. And um, they had gone pretty far for a while. And then there was kind of a you know, late 70s, throughout the 80s, it was just kind of average and, and kind of first, there were some pretty down years in there as well. And when, when Tressler came in, uh, really he kind of spearheaded the, you know, the beginning of changing the culture. That's really what we had to do here is we had to change the culture of how the basketball program was. And Tressler really is the one that got that going. Um, he started organizing, you know, kind of a year around program. I mean, um, back then, um, they weren't really playing, they weren't really doing much in the summertime. Yeah. You know, we started doing stuff in the summer. There were spring leagues and things like that. that what year would you say that? Uh, that was probably 93, 94, somewhere in that range. And, uh, and so over the course of, you know, five years that he was the head coach, um, in 97 was the first time that we had ever, that we had won a league championship yeah. since, like, for at least probably 20 years, a couple decades. So that was a really major, major, uh, major thing. And that, that's really when, you know, he kind of brought a winning mentality here. And really when I took over, I was just kind of, reaping his rewards. I mean, you were playing at that time and yeah. really you were coached by him before you were coached by me. And, you know, it was just like the, the uh, mentality had changed, the culture had changed, and it was already kind of becoming a winning program. And, and you know, a lot of the assistant coaches uh, that, that I was an assistant coach with yeah. stayed on our staff and we just developed a nice continuity and the program just got better from there. And I was actually also a part of that 97 team, mm -hmm. which uh, you think back to it, I mean, you still see, I still see a lot of those guys to this day. And that was kind of a turning point because at that point you had St. Joseph's with Ray Young, yeah. you had St. Mary's um, who was loaded, and St. Joe's was extremely loaded. And Bishop O'Dowd, Bishop O'Dowd was, in the was league still in the league. At that El Cerrito yeah. was also still in the That's league. That's right. So you, you had a, a really good league. Um, so we'll, we'll transition to, now we'll transition to some of Coach's Mel, Coach Mellis' offensive philosophies. As some of you guys may know, he runs a lot of continuity, a lot of motion offense. He's kind of got away from it a little bit now that he's had a lot more talent. Um, but if you pay attention, he still runs a lot of triangle. He still run, runs a lot of motion. He still runs a lot of fist. Um, I'm sure that some of you guys are aware what fist is. It's a three on the wing set and two on the block. So it requires motion and it requires continuity. So coach, just tell us a little bit about your offense philosophies and where you got those from. Uh, you actually kind of alluded to it already. The first thing I will say is I think it's really important for every coach to see what their personnel is. Yeah. Um, we used to have, there have been years where we had a lot of height and not very much quickness. So we would run the offense that you call fist, that we call fist, which is uh, the, the actual name of the offense is the two game, which was started by Ralph Miller way back at Oregon State, way back in the day. He's the one that created that offense. And actually, I learned that offense at Cal 
because Campanelli and Tressler were running that offense at Cal, and so that's where you know we learned it. Um, but the two game is really kind of a, a post first offense. I mean, you can do a lot of nice things out of the with the guards if you have some shooters, but for the most part, it's a two post offense. You get a lot of block to block screens. You get a lot of feeding the post, and at that time for us, we had some size. And we didn't have a ton of quickness, and that was that was the focus for us. Transition that to now, um, while we've had a couple of taller players in recent years, um, our bread and butter has been our quickness, and yeah. we've been able to get out on the break more and trap more on defense and things of that nature. And so, most recently, we've we've run the triangle offense, which has obviously been made famous by you know the Bulls, Phil Jackson when he was at the Bulls, and of course with the Lakers. We also run um, the uh, the dribble drive offense, the dribble attack offense, which is a uh, Vance Wahlberg offense. He uh, made it famous down in the Fresno area, and it's basically a four out, one in offense where you dribble attack and draw help and kick out. and And so, you know, we look at it like we have we have guys that are pretty talented going to the bucket, and I think the game in general has transitioned. And kind of evolved to that, yeah. and so that has turned into becoming a really good offense for us. We were able to get layups out of it. We're able to get kick out wide open threes. We've, if if you can manipulate it good enough, where you have your shooters in the right positions, then you know it works for you. And for us, it's been pretty successful. So I, my first, you know, we're talking philosophy. I I would just basically say that each coach has to look at what their personnel. Is and who they're going to have coming back, and then that's that's what they should, you know, they should find the offense that's going to best suit them, you know, in relation to that. Now we will say the dribble drive. What most of you guys consider the dribble drive is what you see in Kentucky do. That's right. That's but exactly right. As Wahlberg has taught, you never want to dribble over to your guy in the dribble drive. A lot different than Calipari does it. It works both ways. Um, but it's a lot different. Now going back to the two man, the actual name of it, um, as two we game, yeah. two game, yeah. as we called it, fist. Yeah. What I remember the most from this offense is the continuity. Mm-hmm. You had to be, able, you had guys who can make an elbow jump shot, and you had to be able to screen guys. Yeah. So once somebody, once you screen the guy, you had somebody who had to help the screener, mm-hmm. and that led to other things. I don't know if you can correct me on this. I would say that offense. If you have less talent, it almost works better to a certain extent. I would prob- I would agree with you. Um, you also have to be able to have guys that know how to screen. Correct. So that so the good the beautiful thing about that offense is that you have someone that sets a screen, and then someone else is setting a screen for that person. So it's essentially a screen the screener offense. Um, the, I love screen the screener stuff because. If you have guys that really know how to set good screens, when they come and set the first screen and you have someone coming off that, if they set a great screen, their man has to help. And now when you get a down screen and you're screening the screener, now the the original first screener is going to be able to pop up and be wide open for a jump shot. So one of the best things about that offense is if you can take your best shooter and make him the first screener, now when the second screen comes down, he's going to be able to pop up and be wide open for a jump shot. And the reality is, if you're playing against teams that don't uh, really help very well, then probably the guy coming off the first screen in the first place is going to be wide open anyway. So it's it's kind of a good mix between being able to get a big man off a screen around the bucket and then also being able to get a jump shot out of it as well. And there also are some other little nuggets within that two-game offense as far as the back doors, which... You can kind of say in this area, we at Salesian have kind of made running back doors popular again. I mean, yeah. there was time there was times where you could run those plays three or four times with a play called horns, and guys couldn't pick it up. Now you go around the high school games, you see guys running our version of fist that we ran, and you see guys doing a lot of back door, um, and that's the part that I was really intrigued about as a player. You took the thinking out of it. I knew when you overplayed on the wing, that sets up that sets up a back door. And there was also the high post back door. Um, 
So for me, that offense, I taught it, I like to teach it, but it does take a lot of mental aptitude in order to remember it and to keep the floor spacing and to kind of know when to go. And also, um, it's like anything else. If you want to become a great free throw shooter, you have to practice it and have repetition. If you want to be a, a great ball handler, you got to have repetition. If you want to be a great team at the two-game offense, you have to have repetition. It, it's not something that just happens overnight. Uh, obviously, it takes a lot of practice. At the high school game in 32 minutes, I would say if you can score 50 points or 60 points, that's pretty good. You're, at the high school level, you're gonna if you play good defense and you can score 60, 55, 60 points, you're going to win a lot of basketball games. You alluded to the backdoor plays. We have, you know, we had a couple backdoor plays that we would run, you know, maybe anywhere from three to five times per game. Um, we it was almost bread and butter. Yeah. We're getting two points out of it. So really, out of our sixty points that we would normally maybe score 50 or 60 points, um, you could almost say, you know, it's eight points. of them, 10 points right off the bat. We know we're going to get four or five back doors. And so that, at, at times where you would maybe, I mean, every offense has its stagnant points. Yeah, every time there's going to be some sort of stall or whatever, it just doesn't work for you. That's when we knew we could go to a backdoor play and, you know, try to get a shot going to the bucket that was either a, a bucket or get ourselves to the free throw line or whatever. And, um, so I think in each offense, you kind of, again, you know, and we also, I guess just to take that one step further, we always knew who the best passers were and who the best finishers were. So you, you really, you know, it goes back to knowing your personnel. you got to know who, who to put in the right spots and who you want to be the ones coming off the screens to shoot and all that. But, I mean, it, it is a good offense. And within that fist offense, you got to be able to push pass. Yeah. That's like the number one thing yeah. that a lot of high school teams – and a lot of high school players don't teach. You just don't learn it. You don't know how to do it. And you kind of don't know what it is. So we'll transition to this isn't coach's favorite thing, the defensive side of the ball. He prefers, he likes the offensive game, but he but he has learned defense from Tressler. He's learned it from uh, Campanelli. And he's also learned it from his high school coach. So we'll talk about some of your philosophies on the defensive end. Um, well, uh, I, there's... Uh, nothing fun about teaching defense, right? But uh, I will say, as a coach, it's very rewarding when you see your teams play great defense. So, uh, if you know, every coach has their favorite things to teach and whatnot, and you know, it's not the most fun thing to teach defense, but uh, it is what wins games. And, and we have a philosophy: we include rebounding along with the defense. So, I mean, you can you can play great defense and not secure a rebound, and then what does it matter if you were a great defensive team if you're not going to secure a rebound yeah. at the end of the possession? So we have a saying that's, uh, that we stole from a college coach, which is offense sells tickets, defense wins games, yeah. rebounding wins championships. And our philosophy really is more about we have to win the rebounding total in each game. If we, if we win the rebounding war, then we think we're going to win that game. Uh, but having said that, um, Every coach is going to have their own philosophy, and again, it goes back to your personnel. Uh, we've had some taller players that are quick, and, and we've had some good length, so we've started doing a little more trapping over the last couple of years. But when you get down to, get down to it, um, we are a firm believer in man-to-man -man defense. You can do zones, you can do traps, you can mix all that in, but you're going to win games based on your man-to-man -man defense. That's just our philosophy. And, um, so we, we really work hard at, um, at doing the right things on defense. We, we have four things that we really, we call these our four staples of our defense. The first thing is ball pressure. You have to have good ball pressure. You could have guys, you could play against a team that runs great screens and everything, and guys are going to get hung up on screens. If you have a really good guy pressuring the ball, maybe that offensive player doesn't get to pass the ball when that other player comes off the screen is open and, and ball pressure alone can be the, the single most disturbing uh, factor for us, you know, on defense. And so it can, it can hide some of the mistakes that we make behind us. So ball pressure is the first one. 
Uh, the second one is when the ball goes to the wing, we force the ball away from the middle of the floor. We want the but we call it forcing corner. We want the ball to go towards the baseline. Uh, we do not want the ball to get into the middle of the paint. Um, if the ball gets into the paint, uh, at our level, at the varsity level, and certainly at the college level, uh, guys are way too good with the ball. There's too many options. They get in the paint, they can shoot, they can feed the post, they can kick multiple ways for jump shots. So we have to keep the ball out of the middle of the paint. So ball pressure is the first one. The second one is when the ball goes to the wing, we force corner. Uh, the third one is in the, in the post. Uh, we, we have our posts guard on the baseline side. Um, and the reason for that is if the ball is on the wing and we get beat to the baseline side, we want our post guy to be guarding on the baseline side, and that's where the help comes from. Uh, you know, and, then, and then the fourth one, so the third one is guarding in the post on the baseline side, and then the fourth one uh, is, is our weak side help. Um, if you draw a line from rim to rim, we call that the basket line. Uh, when the ball's at the wing, we want our weak side guys literally on the basket line. Yeah. And at the college level, maybe that doesn't happen because there's such good shooters that cross-court passes for threes happen way too much. Guys are too good as shooters at the college level. But at the high school level, the best shooters make three out of ten. Yeah. And we'll take our chances on giving up threes. We don't want to give up layups. So four staples of our defense, ball pressure, forcing corner from the wing, um, you know, uh, inside the post, we're guarding on the baseline side, and the fourth one is being on the basket line on the weak side. Now let's get back to number three, as far as guarding in the post. Yeah. Would you say it's three quarters? Are you guarding them three quarters on the top side, sure. or are you just okay. three quarters on the bottom side to yeah. cut off that baseline? So we're basically, um, if you imagine a post guy posting up, we're literally straddling his leg on the baseline side. Right. We want. Um, one foot to be behind him towards the basket. If we have a full front and the shot goes up, that guy's going to be able to spin and get an offensive rebound. We actually want to straddle his leg and put an arm around. Our philosophy, we don't want the ball to go into the post, but it's not just the postman defender. It's not just his job to take that away. It's his job to be in the right position, it's the guy guarding the ball, having good ball pressure. It's the guy being on the basket line on the weak side. So it's collectively everybody's job taking away the post feed, not just the post guy. So we don't want to make it where the post you know, gets out of defensive rebounding position. We actually want him to straddle that guy on the baseline side and put an arm across. And I also said at the high school level, a lot of bigs, struggle turning to the baseline yeah. to go to their move. They're yeah. all comfortable yeah. going towards the middle yeah. over that, you know, their left shoulder or their right shoulder depending towards their the middle. Right Just depending if they're left-handed yeah. or right-handed. I mean, we also, I mean, we're talking philosophy, but if we know, like we scout every game, every team in advance, so we know tendencies. We know whether a guy is left-handed or right-handed. and We may tweak it a little bit from game to game who we're playing against, and we may say, hey, we don't want... This kid's left-handed. We don't want him shooting over his right shoulder. We may make a couple changes just because, um, but for the most part, we're talking basics right now, and that's kind of our basic philosophy. So now we'll move on to some of Coach's, or one of Coach's favorite quick hitters. The last two or three years, I don't think Coach sees much man-to-man -man defense. A lot of teams are simply playing zone. It can be a matchup zone. It could be a 32. It could be a 1-3-1. They're junking it up. They aren't. They not gonna play. They will not play man for a 32 minute game. It's just not gonna happen anymore. So at this point, we'll let Coach draw up his favorite play against his own defense. Okay. So the play that uh, that I'm gonna draw up, um, I'll just use the board here. Uh, this is a uh, this is a play that I learned from Coach Newell. Uh, this is a play that he learned from his dad. So Pete Newell Sr., one of the great basketball minds. You know who coached the 1960 Olympic team, who at the time was the considered the best team ever. Yeah. Oscar Robertson, Jerry West, Jerry Lucas. That was considered the best team until the '92 Dream Team. And here I am in 2012 drawing up a play that he created decades later, and uh, uh, drawing up a play that he uh, had decades earlier, I should say. 
and, and the play still works. I mean, it's pretty simple. This is against a 1-2-2. One, a one, two, two. So if this is the defense, all right, uh, we call this play 32. We start in a 1-2-2 two, two set. So we essentially match right up with their defense. Um, let's just say that the wing is a good shooter. All right, let's say uh, this is a good shooter. We'll th go that way. Um, we pop the guy to the corner and we throw to the corner. Okay, and then these two guys slide over as basically a two guard front. Right. So now what's going to happen is the ball is going to get swung around this way. Okay. So what's happening? Got all that there. Um, so now let's just say the man, the post guy in the corner has the ball. So the defense would probably look something like this. Let's just say like that. So the point guard has, uh, this is the first wing that got the ball. The point guard has slid over into this spot and the wing has slid up to this spot. So it looks like this, all right? Now this guy that got the first pass is now going to be running through to the corner. And the pass is going to be coming around, and we're going to keep swinging. And now what's going to happen, what I really want to do is focus on these two guys right here. Okay? So our man is running through, okay? And this post defender who originally started here, this post defender has to make a decision. Most likely, if you have a good enough shooter, he's going to slide over to defend that. All right? So now as this guy has the ball, and now what I'll do is I'll go back, uh, I'll just go up here now, but we'll go back to here. This guy, by the way, is setting a screen. So he's literally facing across to here. And our wing has run through into this area, right? And then here's that post defender. So this guy has the ball. We've swung the ball like that. We've swung the ball around. So now here's these two guys that I'm talking about, were this defender. This, post, this guy with the ball has to read what this defender is going to do, right? Because the, first, the other post defender was way out here, so he's still in transition. So if you swing the ball fast enough, as he fights over, if he decides to fight over, if he doesn't fight over, you just throw the ball to the corner for an open look. But if he does fight over, we teach our post guys, don't fight the screen, just open up. So if I'm this post defender, uh, I'm sorry, if, this, if I'm the post guy on offense, and my guy's running through and I'm setting the screen, as that defender fights, open, fights over, I just open up for the ball. Because now this guy has a choice. He can throw to the corner for the three, but if the defender fights over, we throw directly into the post to that guy, right? And the last part of the play is that the corner guy that got rid of the ball originally, he flashes to the middle. So we can actually throw the ball to this guy for a little jump shot, or sometimes one of these post guys steps up and we can do a little high-low out of it, post to post. So that's the most basic part. Um, if, you, uh, if you move the ball fast enough, um, you... You know, well, you'll get open looks. You'll get a guy in the post open for a, a little layup. You'll get uh, hopefully a good shooter on the wing that's open. Sometimes we throw the ball to the wing and then that defender fights over and the wing can feed the post. So there's all kinds of little, uh, you know, ways you can kind of tweak it. Again, it's kind of based on personnel, personnel and who you have and all that stuff. But um, that's, that's a play that's been around for so long that... Yeah. Um, and that's against a 1-2-2. Two, two. Uh, it doesn't work as much against a 2-3 a, a zone because um, eventually when that first wing is cutting through and he's running off the screen, you're basically putting three guys across the baseline yeah. to their two. Um, if it's a 2-3 zone, then that outside guy just to get, gets to go to the corner and the middle guy gets to stay with the post. So it really doesn't work against a 2-3 zone. It works more against uh, a 1-2-2. Two, two. So there you have it. Coach is giving you something that you can take home. You can try it, see if it works for you. Um, he got it from Pete Newell, and he's still running it today. Um, last thing we'll talk about, some of Coach's inspirations. He's been doing it a long time. 
as a high school coach, you run out of energy. You get burnt out. There's no question about that. So we'll kind of talk about some of the things that keeps coach going, if how many games he's watching during the week. He's a big time Cal fan, so he might only <laughs> watch those games. But we'll kind of see how see how much basketball he's doing during the week, during the season and off season. So you can kind of get gauge for yourself if you should be doing more or if you should be doing less or if you're just not working hard enough. So coach, how many games would you say during the season you watch on TV or in the gym? Wow, uh, a lot. Uh, one of the, for me, one of the best inventions was TiVo. And uh, maybe for my wife, one of the worst inventions was TiVo because uh, it seems like I'm taping a college game. You know what's great is that a lot of the college games that are on TV are shown a second time, like in the middle of the night. Mm -hmm. I'll set up, I'll set up to tape a game just in the middle of the night, and then watch it at some point during the week. Um, I, I like to watch more college game than pro game. Um, obviously, high school, high school more emulates the college game more so than the pro game. So, um, but I, I would say that I like to uh, kind of choose the college coaches that I think run really great stuff. Michigan State, Tom Izzo. Um, gosh, there, there's a few. Uh, there's a few people. That, I, I don't know. There's a, uh, obviously it's it's great to watch Duke and North Carolinas of the world. We've stolen a lot of stuff from Kansas from Coach Bill Self. Uh, we've you know so so we'll watch. I'll I'll just tape some games. Um, back when uh, when uh, uh, the old uh, the old uh, Maryland coach uh, Gary. Williams. Williams, thank you. Uh, when Gary Williams was there, thank you, before he retired uh, this last year, uh, I loved Gary Williams, and I thought he read a lot of really good stuff. So I, I just kind of go through and go, hey, you know, uh, North Carolina's playing tonight, and I, you know, just set it up or whatever, and, and just go back when I can and watch it and try to steal some things. Um, and, and again, you know, there's, there's times where it could just be something really simple, an out-of-bounds play, a, a, a play against a zone. Uh, a lot of times I'm just watching a game and I'm like, dang, that was wide open. How'd they get that? And I go back and, you know, rewind it and go, wow, that just seems so simple. And so I try to pick plays that are simple enough for the high school game. Um, not all the plays are as simple at the college level. There's a lot of complex plays. But, but uh, you know, to answer your question, um, I'm, probably, I'm probably watching two games a week for sure. Uh, sometimes more. I try to tape them and then maybe catch up on the weekend or whatever because obviously during the season, during the week, we're pretty busy because we're also watching film of our opponents and we're preparing for each game. So, but, you know, college level, I would probably say I try to watch one to two games a week, you know, for sure. And then in the off season, are you, are you watching more games to steal things so you can try to use it for the upcoming season? Um... I would say in the off season, um, I don't know if I'm watching as much. I watch it a lot. Um, I probably watch it more during the season, mm -hmm. and then I'll make little notes to myself, and I kind of have a little folder where I'm like, okay, this is a great thing that we'll put in for next year if we don't put it in this year, but we'll put it in. You know, in the summertime, you know, we get to basically essentially practice now that CIF rules have changed over the years as to what you can and can't do in the summertime. And this is the time of year, you know, in the summer where it's good to try new things. And it, this is the time of year that's really kind of cool in that you're now trying, you're figuring out with guys that have graduated and moved on and you've got new players coming in, what's our uh, focus going to be? And so, you know, if there's a few plays that I see during the year, I might just jot it down and hold on to it and knowing that in the summertime we pull out a few new things and, and try it and then if it seems to work, then that's something that maybe we will continue to do uh, for that particular year. So there you have it. Coach watches enough games. Um, just so you know, the CIF is the California Interscholastic Federation, um, the governing board of high school sports. Um, so there you have it. Coach gave us everything he could give us as far as the offensive and defensive end. Um, come check out a Salesian High School basketball game in 2012-2013. Maybe you'll be able to find some things, still a couple nuggets. We want to say thank you to Coach.
And we also want to tell our viewers, 2 to tie 3 to win dot com. And thank you. Thank you. Like, you look at, you look at Doug. Is Doug at Drake still? Yeah. yeah. You look at Doug. My Hills or Mitty? What are you talking about? Because I know.